could stand it. Deutsche Volksgenossen und Volksgenossen. I mean, he had the power in his speeches to move the masses. As he listens to BBC, he is immediately convinced that they're telling the truth. My friend Helmut thought that was his Christian obligation to warn the people. And then he opened the door and there comes my friend Rudy. And I said, Rudy, what are you doing here? He is the third in our group. I said, what do you mean the third? Who is the second? And Helmut typed on it, Hitler the murderer, Hitler is the guilty one. The first thing we see is that he's emerged from some kind of a process as a full-blown anti-Nazi. He puts the prefix V-E-R on the front of the word Führer, which means that Hitler is now the seducer of the people. I opened the door and there's the two guys with that long dark leather coat and he lifted up his lapel from the coat and there was the badge, Geheime Staatspolizei, Gestapo. The Nazis, they don't want you to know the truth. The truth was deadly. Hey, welcome everybody to the Truth and Conviction live stream. We are joining you live because it's a live stream. Uh, I am Matt Whitaker and um, I wanna welcome all of you uh, of course, our Truth Conviction fans and our Angel, Angel Studios fans, uh, and any who are joining us for the first time tonight, it is, it's great to have you here. Um, I, tonight, we're going to talk about some things that I'm very passionate about. And uh, so I actually, although I don't, um, it's no secret, I think if you've watched any of our previous live streams, they're not my favorite thing to do, but I'm, <laughs> I do them. And, uh, but tonight, I'm, I'm genuinely excited uh, to talk to you about about some things that are that are very important to me, um, but to to those of you who are tuning in for the first time, I just kind of want to give you a quick overview of of what this what this project is and kind of where we are at with it. Uh, this is, uh, of course, the Truth and Conviction uh, limited series with Angel Studios, uh, the true story of a teenager by the name of Helmut Hubner who was 16 years old and decided that he needed to stand up against Hitler and recruited some of his friends and wrote these amazing and powerful uh, flyers and leaflets filled with the truth. And, and these teenagers were putting them out across Hamburg, uh, right in the heart of, of Nazi Germany. Um, and it's a, it's a powerful story that has captured my attention for, for more than 20 years. So I'm very excited to now be at a, at a, at a place and at a time where we can, we can get this out there. Um, of course, if you're familiar at all with, uh, with Angel Studios, uh, we are reaching out to you. We're reaching out to the people um, to help us get these these worthwhile projects made. And right now we're in a, a phase that they call testing the waters. So what that means is um, we're just asking people who think, man, that is a story. I would love to see a movie or a series about this. Um, I think I'd like to be involved. Then uh, you can click, you can go to angel.com slash truth and, and express interest. And, and essentially what that means is you're just saying, you know, our, we're, we're not asking for investments at this point. You're just saying, hey, if you were asking for investments, you know what, I would invest this much, um, or I think I would, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, and that's, really, that's really what we're doing. And, and once we have enough people who, who express interest and decide that, uh, you know, if, if the investment were open, that they would that they would want to be involved. Uh, then at that point, uh, we hope to be able to actually open it up for for investors um, to to take part in this and and not just be um, kind of making. It's not a donation. That's the that's the cool thing. It's it's an opportunity to be a part owner in this incredible project. So uh, I I if you haven't had a chance to go to angel.com/truth, uh, you can go over and, and and check it out and see if it's something that you want to express interest in. Um, I am, oh, I also need to, to remember, um, as you're watching this, if you want to click the subscribe button, click the little bell, all those things, are, our analytics people tell me it's helpful. So uh, do that if you can. Uh, and also, I love it when people will comment below. So if you get a chance to, to make a comment, or especially if you've got questions about some of the things that we're going to be talking about or questions about this project, um, 
comment below, ask those questions, and then at the end, I'll be able to take a few minutes and hopefully answer as many questions as I can. So I uh, would love that if you can do that. Okay, so I am, because there's so much <laughs> that I want to talk about, and I know that I can't talk about it all, uh, and there's, I'm going to have to probably skip some things, but I've come prepared. Um, I've got notes and I've got quotes, and we'll see how much of this I can I can get through. So uh, I ask for your forgiveness as if I'm rustling through papers and uh, and and trying to make sure that I don't skip something. And I would ask uh, my incredible team here, uh, Esther and Ryan, if I skip something, just uh, you know yell at me or whisper in my ear or something like that, and and I'll try and and go back and fix it. All right, um, because tonight uh, it is July twentieth. And because it's July 20th, I thought this would be the perfect day, perfect night to talk about uh, those who stood up against Hitler, those who were resistance fighters, sometimes called freedom fighters, against uh, the Nazi regime and against Hitler. And of course, July 20th is a very significant date amongst those, those resistance fighters. It is the, it is the day that uh, Klaus von Stauffenberg, who um, was a colonel in the, in the German army, um, along with a group of other generals and military leaders. Um, oh, if I can just, this photo right here, I just it's just amazing to me. So if you see that's Stauffenberg at the left there, kind of standing at attention, looks like he's just about to shake Hitler's hand. Um, minutes later, they would go into a meeting together in the building, I think that's right behind us in that, in that photo and he would bring a bomb in and set it down underneath the table and then had it arranged that he was going to be able to step out shortly before that bomb was to go off um, and it did uh, this this bomb exploded and and they had a plan and all these generals had a plan how to seize control of the nazi government and and take it over and then create a democracy out of it. And, and all of these incredible, uh, incredibly brave men who risked everything to do that, knowing that if it didn't work, if the bomb didn't go off, um, if it didn't kill Hitler, that their lives were over, that that was going to be it. Um, and unfortunately, it didn't, it didn't work. The bomb did go off and some people were killed in the room but Hitler wasn't. And we'll talk later, uh, a little bit later, about the details of, of, of why that happened and why it didn't work. But um, Klaus von Stauffenberg and, and so many others that were, that were involved, eventually thousands um, that they even suspected might be involved in the July 20th plot uh, were executed. Uh, many of them in the same room, in the same execution chamber, uh, where, where Helmut Hubner, um, who our story is about, had been executed uh, just a couple years earlier. Um, but um, so this is a, uh, it's, it's an important day for me to remember what um, people like, like Klaus von Stauffenberg and others did um, to try and do something. And uh, um, the example of, of the, of what these military men tried to do. I mean, they were military men, and so they what, what did they have access to? They had access to guns and bombs and, and those kinds of things. And so that was the nature of their resistance, was to try and, and kill the person at the top. And, uh, um, and again, it was, it was disastrously unsuccessful, um, but what a valiant effort. But there were also other groups who were trying different approaches. Um, and there were a number of groups, including the Helmut Hubner group, that were peaceful resistance fighters, that they were trying to use information and trying to get the truth out to, to people and trying to get it out to enough people with the hope that the masses would, knowing the truth, the masses would rise up and, and take down, because of the sheer numbers, take down this, uh, this Nazi regime. Um, I also have to say that I, I, I understand, I'm quite taken with 
this idea of, of a peaceful resistance, you know, these peaceful resistance fighters. Um, and I love that approach and the power of a peaceful resistance. Uh, I understand that it's, it's a complex issue and, and I wouldn't want to take anything away from those who tried to use other means doing whatever they could to, uh, to take down Hitler and his, and his regime. Um, but there is, there is a power, I think, to, to the possibilities of a peaceful resistance. And I wanted to read something. This is the, the first of, I came across just, uh, just recently, I came across um, a letter that had been written to Adolf Hitler just about, just a little over a month before he invaded Poland. So, um, and I wanna read this letter. Uh, it's, it's short, but it, it's powerful. So it's dated 23rd July, 1939. And it says, dear friend, Friends have been urging me to write to you for the sake of humanity, but I have resisted the request because of the feeling that any letter from me would be an impertinence. Something tells me that I must not calculate and that I must make my appeal for whatever it may be worth. It is quite clear that you are today the one person in the world who can prevent a war, which may reduce humanity to a savage state. Must you pay that price for an object, however worthy it may appear to you to be? Will you listen to one who has deliberately shunned the method of war, not without considerable success? Anyway, I anticipate your forgiveness if I have erred in writing to you. I remain your sincere friend, Mohandas Karamshan Gandhi. Uh, I was just astounded to read that and to know that Hitler did receive this letter from Gandhi just a month before uh, the war would begin in Europe. And I imagine that it probably felt, well, it obviously fell on deaf ears. Um, I don't know what Hitler's reaction to it was, um, but just think um, if something had changed. Just think this was Gandhi's effort to do that. And I love the way that he refers to even Adolf Hitler as his sincere friend. What an example to, to us all. Uh, jumping back to the Hubner group and, you know, Helmut Hubner and his two best friends, Karl Heinz Schnibbe and Rudi Voba, um, operated this, this group. He would type up these, these flyers filled with information that he was getting from the BBC broadcasts in the German language. And also he worked at the city hall. He was uh, worked in this huge Nazi office and where they kept a repository of banned books. And so he had access to these banned books and the, and the truths and the materials, you know, the information that was in there. And he was borrowing those and, and extracting information and creating these leaflets. And, and these boys, 15, 16, 17 years old, um, were going out at night. Um, and putting those up. I want to hold off on that just for a second, Esther. We're gonna we're gonna come to that clip in just a second. Um, but uh, um, so after they after the war finished, you know, after the they were captured and and what happened to them, um, and then the the war finished and and in Germany they were kind of forgotten for for a couple decades, you know. Uh, Karl Heinz and his family and Rudy, they, they had immigrated to America. Of course, Helmut was no, long, Helmut was no longer with us, um, and, and they were kind of forgotten. And uh, until in the, in the mid-60s, there was a young college student in Hamburg, um, a teenager named Ulrich Zander. And, um, and you can cue, there you go, that's, that's a young Uli Zander, who I've had the opportunity to meet, and it's just incredible. He was assigned to do a, a paper for a class he was doing, and he found the story about these three boys in Hamburg, his same city, who had run this resistance group. And so he was he wrote a paper on it um, about Helmut Hubner, and and that paper was found by German author Gunter Grass, who was a Nobel laureate, an acclaimed uh, uh, German author, who had written a book in English called Local Anesthetic, and and in that book he references this, this group of teenage boys in Nazi Germany, this boy, Helmut Hubner, who had tried to peacefully take a stand against Hitler. Um, and, and, and Gunter Grass, this, this acclaimed 
a writer, a German, German writer, who was the same age as Helmut. So they were the same age growing up in Nazi Germany. Um, and then he, of course, lived and, and had gone on to, to write many novels um, about that period and, and exploring what, um, what went wrong. You know, how could this have happened? Um, and it's, this is where the story, this is where the story comes, kind of comes indirectly back to me. So Gunter Grass writes this book. Um, there's a, a young American professor of German, German history and German literature named Alan Kiel, who is, is, who reads this, this, this book by, by Gunter Grass, this German author, and and sees this story about uh, this group of teenage boys and, and Helmut Hübner, who he had never heard of before. And he was just taken with this story um, and decided that he was gonna find out more about this, this group. And Alan Keel, Professor Keel, is the one who really brought this story to the world. He literally has written the book, and in fact, books about uh, the Helmut Hübner resistance group and has made it uh, in a sense, his life's work. Um, he was the one that went back to Germany and performed interviews with surviving mem members of, of Helmut's, uh, um, uh, Helmut's religious group and, uh, and, and tracked down his two best friends, Karl Heinz Schnibbe and Rudi Voba, um, and, uh, and kind of had to coax them to begin to share their stories because they had come to America, they'd gotten married and had, had uh, jobs and were, and were proud to be Americans now. Um, and then here comes this man, Alan Keel, saying, I want to hear your story, and I think other people need to hear it as well. Um, and so uh, it was through um, Alan Keel and his writing, and then eventually I got to meet him about 20, 21 years ago, that um, I learned so much about, uh, about this, the, the Helmut Hübner group, and, and it has uh, captured my attention for these decades as well. Um, but with the, I just had this thought as, as July 20th was approaching, I thought, you know what, I want to reach out to Alan, see if we can just sit down and, and set up a couple cameras and, and talk about resistance groups, talk about the Hubner group, um, talk about the power of peaceful resistance, um, but also, you know, people like Klaus von Stauffenberg and the July 20th plot. So um, I'm just going to watch a, a brief segment of, of my conversation with, with Alan. Um, as he as he talks about um, these uh, these res these resistance efforts. So Esther, do you mind just queuing that up? Okay. Should we rock and roll? We are rolling. Because uh, July twentieth is coming up, can you just kind of tell me what you understand about Stauffenberg and the July twentieth plot and how that played out? Yeah, I I very much don't like uh, to to have to. Uh, ever be in a position to say anything negative about Stauffenberg and his, and his, his co-conspirators. I think they were heroic, uh, absolutely courageous and wise. I think it was just really, really bad luck that the bomb in the briefcase got, when, he, when Stauffenberg left the room, somebody was in somebody's way and they put it behind a big solid leg. This was a, a table that didn't have four legs, it had two big solid legs. Imagine an old library table or something. And somebody put that on the other side of the solid oak leg from Hitler. Um, and uh, they were also not, they were in a different place where they were intended, where the meeting was intended to be. There was some trivial reason why they'd moved it to a shaky little frame box of a, of a shed, a shack. Which gave way, I guess. Which just blew out its roof and its walls and so the blast was expended into the air. Uh, so there are all kinds of physical reasons why this happened. It was just really, really bad luck, I think. Um, so I have the greatest admiration for, for those people, and for their courage and for the sacrifice, because there was a bloody retribution. Stauffenberg himself was uh, gunned down in the courtyard of what was the, in the, what was the equivalent of the Pentagon in the, uh, the so-called Bentler block in Berlin. It's, been, it's now in the Stauffenbergstrasse. The street was named after Stauffenberg. There's a spot there where he was put up against the wall and shot. And in that building, incidentally, up one flight, on one whole wing of the building, there is a memorial to the resistance to, the, uh, to Hitler. And it's interesting that the very first room that you come to is the, is the room dedicated to Helmut Hubener. So Hubener and Stauffenberg had a lot in common. 
The big difference, of course, was that Huebner uh, chose to be nonviolent. I think I share Gunter Grass's view that what really needs to happen in these kinds of cases where a country's been taken over by a demagogue, all other sorts of sources of information have been, have been quenched, uh, destroyed. Um, people don't know um, what's true and what's not true because they've been, you know, the, the Nazi prop propaganda apparatus is legendary, right? It, probably, if you look back on it, it's, uh, it's the most thoroughgoing, scientifically hard-driven propaganda effort that was ever done. Uh, there, was, there were absolutely no other sources of information in Germany. So here's Hubner with his shortwave radio, suddenly listening to the BBC. Um, the point is that, that that happened to be his, his medium. It fell into his hands. Stauffenberg had a bomb. Just love the power of that idea that Helmut had access to a, a radio, a band shortwave radio, where he was listening to the BBC broadcast. He had access to a typewriter. Um, and, uh, and so that was his weapon, uh, was words and the truth. Um, and I'm going to talk more about that in a second, but I, I, I do need to recognize we've already had some people that have, that have pledged or that have expressed interest, um, and I just want to recognize a few of them. Merrily expressed interest at $100. Phil expressed interest at $1,000. Um, we've got several anonymous. Or, uh, some, we have an anonymous who expect, expressed interest at a dollar, and I am totally sincere when I say thank you for that. Because not only is, is the amount uh, important, but the, the number of people who express interest is just actually just as important um, as that. And so thank you, Anonymous, uh, another one for $100, another one for $50. John uh, expressed interest for $1,000. So um, again, thank you. And if, and if uh, you're watching this and think, yeah, I think I, maybe I would like to express interest or at least learn more about it, uh, go to angel.com slash truth. And, uh, and you can you can do that. Um, but as I was saying, um, the, the Gestapo, you know, Helmut was putting out these these flyers. Uh, you know, he was he was listening to the radio. It's interesting that that the Gestapo was more afraid of a typewriter than they were of a pistol. Um, they felt like, you know, a gun we can take away. But what somebody believes, what somebody thinks, um, that was, in their view, more dangerous. And and I I think that they were right, uh, and so that is why they, you know, they banned all except for the people's radio. Uh, they banned uh, access to to news from anywhere else, and so Helmut getting access to that uh, banned shortwave radio and being able to listen to the BBC was a, an important element of that. I just want to show a clip from the documentary that I that I directed on this same story um, uh, that talks about that. So Esther, if you wanted to cue that up. On September 1st, 1939, the same day that Hitler invaded Poland, he enacted a law that restricted listening to any radio broadcasts other than the approved party stations. Propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels increased his efforts to control what information the German people received. Those caught listening to foreign broadcasts could be sentenced to death. Any group of politicians or um, government leaders who place enormous emphasis on propaganda by their own government are inevitably afraid of the propaganda of other governments. And this is partly helps to explain why Goebbels was so sensitive to the foreign broadcasts and why it made listening to them illegal. So you have to realize in Germany we had what we call the Volksempfänger, the People's Radio, and you could only hear three stations visit, Hamburg, Munich and Berlin. So we had to believe what they tell us. Now, there were still a lot of illegal sets uh, around the place which the Gestapo tried to round up, but often soldiers would bring um, radios back with them uh, on leave. After the French army was defeated, Helmut's brother, Gerhard, came home on furlough and he brought home a little shortwave radio, Marke Rola. There was a little bit wrong with it, and Helmut had it fixed, you know, and when his brother left back to his unit, Helmut, one night, 10 o'clock, a few minutes before, turned it on. He played with the scholar and there was a little lot of whistling and you know how it goes. And then he had it. 
10 o'clock sharp, the first three bars from Beethoven says, boom, 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 three times, you know, victory. Three times, and then a, a voice in fluent German said, this is BBC London, we give new Nachrichten in deutscher Sprache. This is BBC London, now we give news in the German language. When he got this shortwave radio, he realized that he had a chance now to hear information that wasn't from the government. And as he listens to BBC, he is immediately convinced that they are telling the truth. So I just see this 16-year-old kid, brilliant, gifted writer, um, hearing these things on the radio and realizing this, this is the truth. And at some point realizing I need to, to get this out there. And, and I can remember the first time I sat down with Carl Heinz Schnibbe, his, his best friend and cohort, um, and him telling me you know, about, about these flyers that Helmut would write. And Carl even said he didn't even fully understand all of them. Uh, some of it went over his head, uh, but he would help him go put it out on the streets at night, uh, and put his own life at risk doing that. Um, but uh, one of the things that I remember Carl telling me is that Helmut would put at the bottom of a lot of his leaflets, he would, he would write, uh, this is a chain letter, pass it on. So he had this, this hope that uh, one person would read it and share it with a neighbor and pass it on. And again, eventually that, that more and more people would, would learn the truth and, and hopefully rise up um, and to be able to do that in a peaceful manner. I just think was just such a, a, a noble a noble goal. And and I should say that the, the Hubner group, Helmut Hubner and his group were not the only peaceful resistance fighters, of course, in Nazi Germany. There were there were a number of others who tried as well using information and, and getting the truth out that way. Um, one of my other heroes is actually he's a um, a pastor, a Christian pastor by the name of, of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, and, um, and Bonhoeffer, before, in, back in the 30s, he was actually from the pulpit and, and doing a lot of writing, standing up and speaking out against the, the Nazi party. And, and as Hitler became more and more powerful throughout the 30s, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, realized at a certain point that, that he actually got word that his life was in danger um, and that he needed to flee. And so he, um, he was able to get out of the country in 1939 and uh, flew over to the to the United States, thinking that he would he would continue to write from there and continue to to uh, continue his resistance efforts from from the United States. But something interesting happened. Uh, about two weeks after he arrived in the United States, he just had this deep feeling that it was a mistake to flee, that he needed to be there, and uh, and so he wrote uh, he wrote a letter to. Uh, to another pastor uh, who was also um, a resistance fighter in his own right. Um, but Bonhoeffer wrote him from America uh, just a couple weeks after he left. And, and I'll just read briefly just a portion of what he said. He said, I've come to the conclusion that I made a mistake in coming to America. I must live through this difficult period in our national history with the people of Germany. I will have no right to participate in the reconstruction of Christian life in Germany after the war if I do not share the trials of this time with my people. Christians in Germany will have to face the terrible alternative of either willing the defeat of their nation in order that Christian civilization may survive, or willing the victory of their nation and thereby, and thereby destroying civilization. I know which of these alternatives I must choose, but I cannot make that choice from security. And so he returned to Germany and continued to write and preach against Hitler and against uh, the Nazi regime and was arrested. And uh, eventually, right before the end of the war, he was in a concentration camp and was executed for his, for standing up and for his beliefs. Um, again, one of my, another one of my heroes for what he's done. Uh, there's also the White Rose Group. Some of you may have may be more familiar with that, with uh, the White Rose Group, with uh, the um, with Sophie Scholl and her brother Hans Scholl and other uh, college students. These were these were kids kids in their 
um, in their 20s. Uh, there was also some college professors that were that were working with them involved, but they were writing up flyers. Uh, this is actually, in fact, it was less than a month after Helmut was executed that the White Rose Group began their resistance efforts. And you can see, though, here, these are the mugshots. Of course, they too were caught. Uh, there's Sophie Scholl right there and her, her mugshot. She looks like a little girl um, in some ways, but did so much, tried so hard to, to get the truth out. Um, and yet, uh, all of these, these efforts to peacefully stand up um, were met in one sense with failure. They, they, all of them were, were executed uh, for, for trying to do it. And, and I, I talked with Alan Keel about that. I, I, you know, about that, did it make any difference what these people did, what Helmut or what the Wise Rose Group or what Bonhoeffer and others did in their efforts to peacefully resist, did it make a difference at all? And, um, and, and this is what Alan's, Alan's response was. But so you want to cue that up, Esther? Uh, this is sorry. something that has that has um, taken up a big part of your of your life, and and because of you, now mine. Yeah, <laughs> of yeah, it's my Carl. fault, isn't it? I take the blame. <laughs> but what are your feelings yeah. about about Helmut and what you've learned, and and, yeah. and what he means to you personally? Oh, that's a very good question. I yeah, uh, as I may have said earlier, briefly the. In 1971, 72, I thought, you know, Doug Toller and I will interview a few people. Um, we'll put together a, an article with relevant facts of who these people were, what they did. The point is, um, I thought that would be, you know, over and done. But it did kind of take on a life of its own, and I haven't really objected to that. Um, because I have felt, to getting to your question, I have, I have felt a sort of a sense of responsibility and of ownership. Because I, I have to imagine that one of the disappointments in the life of a 17-year-old is about to be, uh, have his head cut off is, you know, my life's being cut short. Um, it, it has no meaning. But I would think that if a person dies in those circumstances, passes on, and then someone picks up that person's life as a cause, and, and, and genuinely believes that it would be a good thing for more people to know about, which I think has been actually borne out. When I started this in 1971, we had Richard Nixon to deal with. I would think that almost anybody would agree that in 2022, things in the United States uh, are such that we really should be learning from someone like Helmut Hubner. And, you know, what else is there that I could do that is, you know, that is that significant? It was, it was actually quite, uh, quite moving for me to, uh, to hear Alan's, um, even the emotion in his voice as he, as he talked about, you know, he's a scholar and, and he's delved into the, into the facts and, and the history of this. Um, but there's also, uh, it means a lot to him and I was grateful to be able to, to get that insight from him. Um, we've got another clip from, from Alan and um, Esther, maybe we can, we can bring that, uh, bring that up uh, where Alan talks about the, uh, um, talks about the, the different revolutions. Let's see, do we have that? We don't have that, okay, all right. We won't, we won't go there. Um, one of the things that, uh, um, that was important to me as I was, as I was looking, one of the things that Alan talked to me about uh, was the fact that although we can look at, at Helmut's um, uh, resistance efforts and all these others, these peaceful resistance efforts and think, well, they all were, were killed and, and did it make any difference? Alan has a really interesting perspective on that because uh, he feels like what, what those peaceful resistance fighters did became kind of the soil where um, post-war Germany could grow out of, you know, and, and, and even he was specifically talked about in East Germany 
you know, which was under communist uh, rule after World War II. And, and then in 1989, and throughout the 80s, but in 1989, and, and some of you are old enough to remember this, when it, it began in the city of Leipzig in Germany, um, there was a big church there, uh, the St. Nicholas uh, Church, and there was a, a pastor there who had been having what he uh, called these peace prayers. And, and every Monday night, he'd been doing this for years, where he would just invite anyone who wanted to to come and um, have prayers for peace. And it started to grow and more and more people started to come. So the communist government in East Germany started getting worried about it. And so they put up barricades. So people, you know, hoping to stop people, but more people started to, to show up to that. And um, eventually it spilled into the streets. Um, and in October of 1989, there were 70,000 people walking the streets of Leipzig. And of course, you know, right around the corner, there were all of the police with their shields and their uh, water hoses and guns and, and just waiting for someone to throw that first rock through a window, um, waiting for someone to be in the least bit violent and then they would attack. Um, but nobody did. And one of the beautiful parts about that is, is that so many of them were carrying candles. And so they were walking and, and, and if you're carrying a candle, you've got one hand carrying the candle and you've got the other one kind of shading it from the wind to keep it alive. And so you don't have a hand to bend down and, and pick up a rock. Um, and uh, I see we've, we've got the clip, but, uh, but I think we're okay. I think we're good. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, they, they, they didn't have a free hand to pick up a rock. Uh, or to or to make a fist and punch somebody, and so they couldn't they couldn't do that. And, and in fact, there were reports afterwards that uh, one of the communist leaders there said we were prepared for everything, uh, except for uh, candles and prayers, <laughs> and they didn't know what to do with it. And it's just amazing to think that um, that was in October. I think it was October 9th of 1989 was when that 70,000 people marched the streets of, of, um, of Leipzig with the candles in their hands and peacefully resisted. Um, and then soon there were hundreds of thousands. Um, and then after that, across it spread across East Germany and there were, there were you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people all across East Germany that were doing that. And uh, a week later, the Berlin Wall fell. Um, and Shortly after that, um, the Soviet Union uh, fell. So uh, it's it's amazing to think that's a perfect example. And again, Alan Keel feel, feels very strongly that the actions of groups like Helmut Hubner and and other peaceful resistance groups prepared the way for Germans after that to find for them what was the most powerful way. To protest and and to resist and and I've got just a, one more one more of the letter. So this this pastor that I talked about that was the he was the pastor of the of that church in in Leipzig. Um, his name and this is a great name. His name really was Christian Führer, uh, Christian Führer. Which uh, Führer, if you know, we, we hear the word Führer and we think of of Hitler. It, it, in German, it means leader. And so uh, this pastor's real name was Christian Leader. Um, and he, he gave an interview years later about that event. And if I can just read just a couple of brief responses that he gave. So, so the, the journalist asked him, you know, how did the demonstrations go on October 9th? And this is what he said. He said, around 6,000, 8,000 people were crammed in the churches in central Leipzig, and a total of 70,000 people had gathered in the city. Everyone was holding a candle, a symbol of nonviolence, you need to hold, this is what I was mentioning, you need to hold a candle with both hands to keep it from going out, which makes it impossible to throw stones. Um, he said, had we thrown stones, they would have known what to do. They would have attacked. But the tanks had no choice but to withdraw without a single shot being fired. And that's when we knew that the German Democratic Republic would never be the same again. And then the journalist asked him or said, you urged the demonstrators to remain peaceful and told them not to be daunted by the tanks. What made you so confident that the peaceful protests would work? And his response, we were not in the least confident. 
We were afraid day and night, but we had the courage of our convictions. The Bible had taught us the power of peaceful protest, and this was the only weapon we had. What moved me the most was that people who had grown up in two atheist dictatorships, first the Nazis, then the communist regimes, were able to distill the message of Jesus into two words, no violence. And then they practiced what they preached. If miracles happen, this truly was one. It was the first successful revolution, and it was a peaceful one. I just think that is so uh, incredibly powerful. Um, I, I want to talk just a little bit more about, about the amazing peaceful revolutions that took place in, in Western and Eastern Europe, as, uh, um, especially Eastern Europe, um, in, in the late 80s and early 90s. But I do need to, to also recognize, oh man, we've had some people that are expressing interest. Carlos C. from Colorado expressed an interest at $150. Uh, Cole expressed interest at $100, Sherry at $150, um, an anonymous person expressed interest at $500, another anonymous at $150, another anonymous at $10. Man, thank you again. Thanks, everybody, for, for that. And uh, if you'd like to, go over to, um, to angel.com slash truth and uh, learn more about it and express interest if, if uh, you feel so inclined. Okay. Um, let's see here. Oh, yes. How are we doing on time? Am I okay? I've got just a few more minutes. Um, I've got uh, just one other story. As I was doing research about the, you know, what happened in, in East Germany and that peaceful resistance movement that rose up, um, I, I came across another example that, that, I wasn't, that I wasn't aware of until relatively recently. Um, but in the, in the Baltic states, so, you know, um, the countries of, of Estonia and uh, Lithuania and Latvia, these tiny little countries kind of tucked up there on the, the uh, northwestern corner of the Soviet Union at the time. Um, they did some amazing things to stand up peacefully. Um, and I just want to talk about, so in Estonia, and Estonia is a country, it's, it's one of the smallest countries in the world. It has, I think, a population of like 1.3 million people. Tiny country that would have a huge impact on overturning the Soviet Union. Um, that the Estonians have this deep and long, centuries-long tradition of folk songs and singing songs. Um, and so they began, in the late 80s, they began gathering in groups and singing banned um, patriotic songs from their country that, that they weren't supposed to sing. And these groups started small but got bigger, and then there were 10,000, then there were 50,000. And soon, in a country as small as that is, there were still there were hundreds of thousands of people. They call it the singing revolution because uh, it it uh, what it did. And of course, there, it's nuanced, and there are a lot of other things that were taking place. But one of the things that this did is these people gathering together and singing songs that they weren't supposed to sing. It even got to the Estonian communist leaders. Um, that some of them began to change their mind or began to have the courage to say, you know what, it's time for a change. It's time to stand up. And uh, another just amazing thing that, that they did is the three countries of the, of the Balkan states um, on, on the, I think it was the 40th anniversary of when the Soviet Union had taken over the Balkans, uh, or excuse me, not the Balkans, the Baltic states. Let me get that right, the Baltic states. Um, but those three, those three countries... They held what's called, what became uh, known as the Baltic chain, where over a million, about one and a half million people designated a day and they joined hands from Tallinn, the capital of, um, of Estonia, all the way through Latvia to Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania. And they joined hands and, um, and it was this huge statement that they were joined together and, and it was this peaceful statement again that all these things came to eventually uh, topple the Soviet Union. It was just shortly thereafter that uh, Gorbachev resigned on Christmas Day of 1989, or excuse me, of 1991, and, um, and the world has, has not been the same since. 
Um, so anyway, I just wanted to, to, to share those stories. And, and I, I share all of those. Uh, hopefully you can feel my excitement <laughs> as I talk about um, these kinds of, of ways to, to stand up against something that's wrong. Um, and I understand that, uh, of course I understand that there are times when it's appropriate and it's sometimes the only option to, um, that, that violence sometimes is, is the only option. Uh, sometimes the bully has to take it in the face um, to protect uh, others. Uh, I, I was thinking the other day, just even of uh, on 9-11, those who passengers who were in United, United Flight 93, and once they heard the news about what had happened with other planes and, and knew where they were headed or had an idea where they were headed, they stood up and used every means at their disposal to try and, and take over that, that cockpit. Um, so I, again, I say that to say I understand that there are times when, um, when a peaceful resistance is not an option, but I'm so grateful for those people like Helmut Hubner, a teenager, um, to remind me that there are so many times in whatever we need to stand up to, um, that it can be done peacefully, and that if people have the truth, if the people have the information, um, that it, that truly can, um, well, can change the world. So, and that's why, frankly, that's why we're trying to make this series. That's why we're trying to make Truth and Conviction. Um, yes, it's a powerful story. Yes, I love a good movie. I love a good series. Um, but uh, I do feel it's also something that has a chance to, maybe in its own little way, to make a difference and to remind us and to remind those who see it um, that there were those in Nazi Germany, even teenagers, who stood up and who stood up peacefully. Um, if you haven't had a chance yet, I would invite you to go to angel.com slash truth and uh, and again, check it out. You'll see some, some information there. And if it's something that, that if you feel like, you know what, um, I want to be a part of, of helping get this series made, um, then express interest and, and let us know. I greatly appreciate it. OK, um, I don't know if there were any questions. Ryan, do we know if, uh, if, if there were any questions that we want to talk in, go over? He, Ryan's looking at Esther, and Esther is saying, Oh, there are questions. Okay, <laughs> they're up on the screen. Let's see. Uh, will there be mentions of other resistance groups in the series? Um, that's that's actually a really good question. In, in this series, we uh, we we may mention uh, some who came before them, but it's interesting that you know of, of a lot of these these resistance groups that I've been talking about, with the exception of Bonhoeffer. Um, Helmut and what he was seeing really came early in this, uh, you know, in 1940, 1941, he was seeing things. He was predicting that Germany was going to lose the war at a time when they were dominating. You know, they were just going from country to country in Europe and taking it over. And, and here's this, this teenager, this 16-year-old saying, Germany's going to lose the war, and here's why. And... Um, but these other groups, a lot of them did come, come later when they realized, you know, for Bonhoeffer and then these other military leaders, they realized we're going to lose this war and, and we've got to stop what's going on. And so long answer to a really good question, but um, we'll make brief mention of some of those other peaceful resistance groups that took place before, but a lot of them did take place after, after that. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. We'll, we'll stop there. Um, Let's see. I think I've reminded everybody. I'll just say it one more time. Uh, if you haven't had a chance yet, go to angel.com slash truth, and, uh, and you can express interest. Oh, that's what I forgot to do. I can see it there now. So when you go there, you'll see that it, it gives an amount. So that amount you see there, which now, wow, now we're at uh, $663,045. That is, is people who have expressed interest to that amount. Um, and so... And it's amazing for, for me to see that, and, and we're, we're well on our way. So if you get a chance to go over there, you can, you can look at that. Um, and you know what? Thank you. Thank you for letting me 
talk about something that that is very important to me. Um, thank you for your for your time. Um, we will have more live streams in in the future, and uh, and we'll be sure and let you know. But uh, in the in the meantime, thank you for watching. Thank you for sharing it with others. Um, if if you if that's something that you that you feel inclined to do, uh, thank you for letting other people know. Uh, I am grateful, and I, I will sign off and just let you know that we're going to after I say goodbye here. Uh, we're going to show our um, our, our pitch video. Uh, we call it the testing the waters video. And, um, and it's just a, a deeper dive into the Helmut Huebner story and, and how I found it and, and why I and my, my wonderful partners at, Col at uh, Kaleidoscope Pictures are so committed to make it. So uh, if you haven't had a chance to see it, and even if you have, um, it may be worth a rewatch. So again, thank you to everyone. I really appreciate your time, and um, we will see you next time. You've just seen the proof of concept trailer for Truth and Conviction which will be the first dramatic series about teenage resistance fighters in Nazi Germany. It tells the true story of Helmut Hübner, who at 16 years old was willing to sacrifice his life to stand up for truth and freedom. There will be more powerful scenes to follow, but I just wanted to take a moment and invite you to join us. If you think this story should be a series, show your support. Click or visit angel.com slash truth and let us know. Bad take two, can AC. Mark. How did you first discover the story of Helmut Hübner? I heard about uh, an old man who was the last surviving member of a teenage Nazi resistance group named Karl Heinz Schnibbe. Heard that he lived less than an hour away from me. I just called him up on the phone, asked if he would be willing to share his story with me. He said, yeah, sure, come on up. So I went up to his house, and sat down with him, and let him just share what his experience was uh, as a 17-year-old with his best friend Helmut Hübner and another friend Rudy. 15, 16, 17 years old standing up against Hitler. And they weren't using guns or fists to do it. They were using a typewriter. I was scared, I was actually scared because we read in the newspaper every day how severely these people get punished. The Nazis, they don't want you to know the truth, you know? The truth was deadly in, in Germany. But I was nosy enough to want to know more. The story that Karl told me that day um, has changed the rest of my life. I walked out of his house that day just knowing we have to make this into a movie. We have to tell this story. We've had the opportunity to become really close friends with Carl uh, over the years. He would share these experiences that he had. He would often get this distant look in his eyes. You could tell he was back in those moments. But to hear this you know, 80 year old man saying, this is what we did. You know, that brings a reality to it, that it's just not just a story, but people lived this. What came out of that was, you know, this not only we have to tell the story, but I feel entrusted to tell the story from Carl. The screenplay is, is incredibly powerful. Matt Whitaker and his writing partner, Ethan Vincent, have really captured this engaging character piece set within Nazi Germany. And it's, it's gained the attention of, of Hollywood uh, producers, including Jerry Mullen, who was the Academy Award winner for Schindler's List. He understands the power and the importance of telling stories from that era. It's really amazing to me to think this kid was 16. He wasn't 25, he wasn't 42, he was 16 years old. 
and had enough to, to realize that he wasn't going to get, he wasn't going to give in to something that he saw was wrong. One of the most important parts of the story for me was Helmut's friendship with Zalamon Schwartz, who was Jewish. One day, Zalamon disappeared, and the Gestapo arrested him, and Helmut never saw his friend again. We went to church, to our church house, and there was a sign on the door which read, Juden is der Zutritt verboten. Jews not allowed to enter. And we had one Jewish member in our branch, Solomon Schwartz. You know, and they didn't let that young man in. He stood outside the door, and when we opened up with it, opening him, he was crying, but they didn't let him in. I wonder how I would feel if somebody took my best friend away. <laughs> you know, what would I do? For Helmut, um, it was time to sit down and start typing up the truth. It wasn't too long after Helmut started typing up these leaflets and putting them out that he realized he needed help. And so he went right to his two good friends, Karl Schnibbe and Rudy Voba, and asked them to help him. Helmut said, let's make a promise. He who gets caught first takes the blame. Don't incriminate anybody. And that sounds good to me because I thought I'm cool. I was the oldest, you know. I said, they don't catch me. So I said, all right. So uh, we went that night home with uh, about uh, 15 uh, flyers and Helmut typed on it, Hitler the murderer, Hitler is the guilty one. I put him in telephone booths, I put him in, in mailboxes. The following Sunday in church, he saw me coming and he waved at me and I waved back and he yelled to the church, they haven't arrested you yet, have they? And oh, I said, will you shut up? I was, <laughs> you know, so that was Helmut, joking, you know. They were dispersing these treasonous leaflets uh, throughout Hamburg, Germany. They put them in phone booths and mailboxes and sneak them into coat pockets at the opera, eluding the Gestapo for almost a year. <laughs> Eventually, they were caught, they went to trial. At a certain point, Helmut decided he had to stand up and he had to take the attention and focus all on himself to save his two friends. And so that's exactly what he did. He stood up, he did what was right, and he let the consequences follow. Helmut was executed for standing up for truth. Carl and Rudy spent years in prison and in hard labor. An experience I'll never forget was going with Carl back to Germany and visiting some of those places where he was held as a prisoner, as a 17-year-old. But also visiting the site where Helmut was executed. And being there with Carl um, was, was truly moving. There was a busload of teenagers that pulled up with their high school teacher. And they got out and they were looking, you know, visiting this site and he just immediately gathered all of his students around Carl and said, tell us your story. To watch Carl tell them what he had done when he was their age was so powerful. They were getting it. That for me was when a seed was really planted. I began to realize that this isn't just a powerful story. This is a story that changes people who hear it. Just another quick invite, if you want to see this story made into a series, click or visit angel.com slash truth to show your support. Don't worry, you're not buying or committing to anything, we just need to gauge how many of you want to be a part of bringing this story to the world. And we are partnering with Baltic Films in Vilnius, Lithuania to shoot Truth and Conviction. Uh, we produced two films with them previously, and uh, we're excited to go back and, and work with a really great production partner. They previously produced HBO's Chernobyl series, as well as HBO's John Adams miniseries and the BBC's War and Peace. Another partnership we're very excited about is with Angel Studios. They've had such incredible success with the Chosen series, and we're excited to bring this project to the global audience that they've been able to reach. Our mission is to tell stories that amplify light. And when we saw the story of truth and conviction, and what that, the creators behind that story, we realized that they were gonna be able to tell a story that has those same principles that The Chosen and any other project that amplifies light. And it's a story that needs to be told today.
It's a story that matters now. Helmut had big blue eyes. I mean, really big, dark blue eyes. And I never saw Helmut emotionally, you know. He never showed his emotion when, when something happened. And when I put my arms around him, I told Helmut, I see you pretty soon. His eyes filled with tears. And he said to me, I hope you have a better life and a better Germany. And then he cried. You know, we talk about stories like Helmut's story of someone sacrificing their life for someone else. I've always felt that there's like this, across humanity, it's like there's this deep connection with those kinds of stories. For me, that's what Helmut did. At some point, he must have known he was gonna be sacrificing his life to do that, right. but he did it anyway. That compels me to tell this story. I personally am asking you to get this made, get it out there, let the world understand what this young German kid did in 1942. Talk to your friends and tell them. Even though he died in 1942, his example of courage, of character, of commitment, we're talking about today. I love what he's about. I want to be just like him. Thanks for watching. Help us share this powerful story to honor Helmut, Carl, and Rudy, and hopefully inspire a new generation. To express your interest in this series, click now or go to angel.com truth to show your support.